presentation on the Skagit County Wildfire Risk Assessment Analysis for the County Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Yeah, good morning, Nick. Uh, as we start in this, we're gonna be looking at the uh, risk assessment that we did for uh, Skagit County with regard to wildfire. And this is part of Skagit County's Community Wildfire Protection Plan. The CWPP is a chapter in the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan of Skagit County. And it's a plan that's required by FEMA and it's updated every five or six years. And uh, the last time, uh, well, this was, this was done for the 2019 update and was eventually signed off by all the agencies in 2020. The previous plan was uh, completed in 2009. So we were well overdue for updating this plan. And in that interim period there, that 10 year period, FEMA has changed a lot of the requirements along with the other federal agencies with regard to wildfire protection planning. So hopefully this will give you some idea of, uh, of what we've got. Originally, I did this presentation for uh, uh, a wildfire conference in Denver, Colorado back in 2015. At that point, it was a work in progress and there was a, a lot we still had to do on it. Uh, so when we talk about forest health, we must also include fire. And when we talk about fire, we must also talk about forest health. Before I talk, before I start, I wanna talk about the Skagit model. And let me tell you a little bit about the Skagit. The key to achieving forest health is developing good forest management prescriptions. Forest management resistant to fire will also be resistant to damage by insects, disease organisms, and extreme weather conditions. With the added advantage of protecting fish, wildlife, watersheds, and other public resources. Wildfire planning should be part of forest conservation planning. We are located at the foot of Mount Baker in the Northwest Washington State. First, I'd like to mention our partners who assisted on this project. Without our partners, planning and project implementation would not be possible. Although the frequency of fire occurrence is lower than the eastern part of the state, the potential for catastrophic fire is higher. The 2015 Goodell Creek fire burned 7,300 acres and threatened the towns of New Halem and Diablo. The 1998 Jordan Creek fire burned 1,164 acres and several structures. Our major catastrophic fire interval is about 20 years. Just long enough for people to forget catastrophic wildfire can happen in Skagit County. Input from and coordination with local fire districts is through Skagit County Department of Emergency Management 911 Center. We have 24 fire districts in Skagit County to coordinate with. A survey of Skagit County fire chiefs and fire commissioners identified the areas of greatest concern within each fire district. You're looking at a, a satellite photo here of Skagit County and the Skagit is an ecologically diverse region. Uh, in the presentation, I will slowly zoom in from the landscape level to the individual landowner level. This will allow us to better assess the wildfire hazard risk in a specific community. Wildfire risk is a measure of both the probability and the consequences of uncertain future wildfire events. 
There are three components of wildfire risk, likelihood, intensity, and susceptibility. It is challenging to assess wildfire risk at the countywide scale with accuracy, given the amount of variability within the county. Delineating varying wildfire risk levels to low, high, or extreme should be done at the neighborhood scale so that site-specific data can be incorporated into a, a CWPP. Okay. The six categories listed are the GIS layers we use to develop the Skagit model and the science behind the model. The GIS layers are listed in the ranking order. So we use these to filter out uh, different areas of the county. So applying the model to the WUI, that's the wild urban interface. And some areas were too small to show up to scale. Um, Probably not unlike some of you, we have a large geographic area to service with limited resources. To refine our scope, we need to prioritize high-risk communities and limit the exposure to first responders. From Puget Sound to Cascade Crest is 94 air miles. By road, it's much further to reach some of our communities. The map was prepared by a joint agency team using best available science. The Skagit model identified high-risk areas as shown in red using geology, soils, aspect, slope, vegetation, and then census data. Our previous hazard model only used population data. That was the 2009 uh, CWPP. And I'm going to stop and mention that both the, the CWPP uh, you know, a wildfire protection plan uh, is available on the Skagit Conservation District website and on Skagit County Department of Emergency Management website, if you just scroll down and look for a community wildfire protection plan. The hazard assessment provides us a guide to focus our prevention efforts. So you can see on the map the red areas there that we're primarily concentrating on. Okay. The first uh, layer that we used uh, was geologic data. That's areas where bedrock or sedimentary rock is at the surface or near the surface with shallow soil depth, limiting the sto soil water storage capacity. And this data comes from the, uh, the DNR, Department of Natural Resources uh, geologic uh, portal. And the uh, website there is on the lower left. I'll try to give these references as we go through the program so you'll can go back and look up the specific information if you're interested. The next layer is soil data. The AWC, that's available water capacity of Skagit soils range from 0 0.05 inches per inch, that's inch of water per inch of soil to 0 0.40 inch per inch. That's a huge difference, an eight-fold increase in AWC. AWC less than or equal to 0 0.15 inch per inch causes plant moisture stress, elevates flammability of fuels. And the source here is from uh, the NRCS uh, Soil Survey of Skagit County. So AWC, uh, looking at this chart, is the area between the field capacity, which is the top line on the graph, and the bottom line, which is the permanent wilting point. On the x-axis, we have various uh, uh, soil texture types from sand to clay. And on the y-axis, we have our soil water content in percent. The middle line in red is the, is the wilting point. And that's the point where plants receive water they would recover uh, below that. When we get to the permanent wilting point, even if they got water, they, they would not recover. And this greatly affects the flammability of fuels. Looking at this in a chart, just looking at the top line um, uh, on the soil textures here, we have sand, the, the FC, that's the, few, that's the uh, fuel capacity is at 10% and the PWP, the permanent wilting point at 
which gives us a very low AWC. There are a number of soils types in each of these texture types. We have 166 soil types in Skagit County. So these were all filtered through uh, using the GIS model. The next level was vegetation types or ESDs. And so looking at the type of vegetation that we would find in different locations, landscape level management practices cannot be generalized. What works well in one area may not work well in another. The ESD is an important step in planning. Our firewise and forest health plans must be based on be best available science. Looking across any landscape, it's not difficult to recognize that some parts are different from other parts in regards to kinds and amounts of vegetation. To understand this variation across the landscape, we classify these different parts in the units called ecological sites. An ecological site is defined as a distinctive kind of land with specific characteristics that differs from, differs from other kinds of land in its ability to produce a distinctive kind and amount of vegetation. Any land inventory, analysis, and resulting management decisions require knowledge of these individual sites and their interrelationship to one another on the landscape. The ecological site description is a document that will contain information about individual ecological sites. ESDs may cover a large area and may need additional botanical inventory work to be specific. And we're in uh, what NRCS calls the MLRA2 major land use resource area. And so to be more specific, we need additional uh, uh, on the ground inventory to better define our ecological sites. So the data comprising the ecological site description or ESD is presented in four major categories. Site characteristics, identifies the site, describes the physiographic climate, soil, water features associated with the site. Plant communities, describes the ecological dynamics and common plant communities comprising the various vegetative states of the site. The disturbance factors that cause a shift from one state to another are also described. Site interpretations. Interpretive information pertinent to the use and the management of the site and its related resources. Supporting information. Provides sources of information and data utilized in the development of site descriptions and the relationship of the site to other ecological sites. Criteria used to differentiate one ecological site for another include, include significant differences in the species or species groups that are in the plant community, significant differences in the relative proportion of species or species groups in the plant community, soil factors that determine plant production, composition, and the hydrology of the site, the function of the ecological processes of the water cycle, mineral cycles, and energy flow. Differences in the kind, proportion, and production of the overstory and understory plants due to the differences in the soil, topography, climate, and environmental factors are the response of vegetation to management. So, as we move from the ecological sites, which is, gives us our vegetation, uh, now we want to look more at a community level where we can apply the model to give us data for accurate planning. So let's look at one community in Skagit County, the Butler Hill community. And looking at this slide, I uh, hope you can note the topography here. Uh, the, the topographic relief is substantial. It's, it's some really... Uh, some steep country within the community. And so topography is the, the next level that we're, we're looking at. So the same slide now, uh, only this is an aerial view 
with the soils uh, overlaid on, on the community. Community level planning, risk levels within a single community may not be the same. The model rates the wildfire risk levels within the community um, in, in three levels. We have red high, yellow is medium, and green is low. This allows us to better focus our prevention efforts. The ecological sites are broken down and described in the Butler Hill Community CWPP. So people in that communities can look at that if they're interested. There are three distinctive ecological sites differentiated using the criteria previously covered. And that's found in the MLRI 2. And first we have the, the 901 landscape description was used for developing ESDs in the red area. The 902 description was used for the yellow area and the 903 description was used for the green area with specific site data added. Okay, the next layer is uh, the effect of aspect and topography. Um, this is a solar image of the Butler Hill community, and it shows three levels of solar radiation. Red is high, yellow is medium, and blue is low. And uh, the source here, this is thanks to uh, Luke uh, Rogers down to UW um, providing this uh, solar image. They're doing a lot of this uh, really good if you're thinking about solar for your home, if you are in an area where you're getting good solar uh, exposure. So this is what, what is affecting uh, some areas of that community and giving us an elevated risk. Okay, <clears throat> so how does this all play into it? Well, trees and vegetations are challenged by moisture. Fuel types have a direct correlation to flammability. The previous factors cover influence the fuel types and conditions, especially green fuels and fuel loading by recent mortality. Dead fuels are classified as one hour or flash fuels, 10 hour, which are quarter inch to one inch diameter fuels, and thousand hour, which are three inch to eight inch diameter fuels. And green fuels are measured by the KBDI index, that's the Ketchum Brian Drought Index, which is tied to soil moisture, going back to what we were looking at those soil textures. Several publications describe desirable plants for the home ignition zone. Okay. I can't show you with my pointer, but the, uh, on this slide, there's ocean spray in the forefront. It provides an excellent ladder fuel growing to 10, 10 to 15 feet tall. The racemes, which are the flowers, uh, dry out in midsummer, ignite easily, and carry fire in the tree crowns. Now, this photo is actually from an actual photo from a fire near Mount Erie in 2018. So, as the fire is approaching from the south, how would this picture change? So, in the background, you can see that the smoke, that's not fog, that's smoke from the fire, the fire is approaching us. So, what would happen? And how does this vegetation affect fire behavior? So we'll go to the next slide and take a look. And here it is. As you can see, our, our one hour fuels, fuels are at the base here of the, of the photo. Our 10 hour fuels are mixed in below that. And our thousand hour fuels are also mixed on the forest floor. And the fire is being carried, carried into the canopy here, as you can see by the uh, ocean spray that's going up. And uh, this is described in the 901 ESD description. A strong wind would change the fire behavior significantly. So note the ocean spray with similar effect uh, with other types of plants, such as scotch broom, which has a high oil content. Uh, we don't have chaparral or manzanita here in this part of the country like they have in California, but scotch broom is about as close as we get. Uh, and we have that as a factor in one community uh, that needs to be uh, addressed in their plan. 
So starting with the structures, we look at how they're built and the construction materials. The NFPA, that's the National Fire Prevention Association, 1144 manual provides construction codes for use by planning departments. This is an important step to, uh, that's often overlooked. The NFPA 1141 manual gives standards for land development activities in the WUI. Again, starting with the structure and working out from the structure in our planning for wildfire. Okay, so let's jump down to the individual landowner level here. And it may look something like this drawing conceptually, where we have three treatment zones. Starting at the house, we have zone one and zone two and zone three as we get farther from the home. And uh, each of these zones, we have a different prescription. Uh, recommendations and a checklist for each zone was developed by fire scientists at the US Forest Service, Service Missoula Fire Science Laboratory. Collectively, the three subzones are called the home ignition zone. They are managed much differently than standard forestry practices beyond the home ignition zone. So this is an actual picture now at the landowner scale. So taking the drawing conceptually, applying it to an actual uh, scenario, the actual treatments may look something like this, and I can't point it out, but right in the center is the home and, and structures with a, a little red triangle around it. Uh, the treatment zones are fit to topography along with fire trails and other practices. The goal is to create survivable space. For many years, we talked about defensible space, but we're really trying to look at if no one's here to do anything and a fire occurred, could this home survive? And so we have the home here in the zone one and moving out from that, you see a black, black dotted line. That is a fire trail that's constructed around zone two uh, to protect the home. And then moving out farther with the red line around that is into zone three. In each of these zones, there's different prescription, treatment prescriptions for each of these zones. Okay. I refer to forest health as applies to factors resulting in the loss of forest vigor or the condition of a forest ecosystem. If landowners recognize unhealthy conditions, they are more likely to support appropriate management actions to improve them. Decline in forest health has a direct effect on fuel loading. So we'll look at some of the forest health aspects here. So first, um, insects, and this is done every five years, forest health highlights in Washington, done in coordination with the DNR and the US Forest Service. And they look at some of the factors affecting forest health every few years. And uh, this picture is some hemlock looper mortality in the Darrington area. And on the left here are actual adults, uh, hemlock loopers, and on, the lower right is hemlock looper damage uh, from an infestation a few years ago. And here we have, uh, looking at some other insects here, we have a number of different types, types of bark beetles. On the left, uh, we have a Douglas fir bark beetle here, an adult, and you can see the eggs in the gallery. Unfortunately, I can't use my pointer, but, uh, and then on the right, the slide, you see the, the gallery in the center, uh, that's running vertically, and as they uh, the, the, the emerge from the eggs and hatch, they feed out on a horizontal direction, effectively girdling the, cam the cambium layer. So this is a dendroctinous uh, beetle. Here's some other beetle damage. Uh, this was from Sheltered Bay in 2018 a different type of uh, bark beetle, the fur engraver beetle. And this beetle uh, lays its eggs on a horizontal plane. And when they hatch, they feed out in the cambium vertically. A lot of times from these uh, different uh, patterns formed by the feeding of the larvae, uh, we can uh, uh, determine what type of bark beetles are present even if the insect itself is long gone. 
Then we have root diseases. They're very common in Western Washington and contrib can contribute to fuel loading. And there's a number of different types of root diseases. And so on the left here is a, actually a seedling. Uh, they can affect anything from mature trees to seedlings. And on the right is a microscopic uh, image of the hyphae, which is the rooting uh, body of the disease. And other types of damage could lead to introduction of causal forest health issues, such as wind, snow, frost, animals, and humans can add to fuel conditions. A dominant factor affected forest health is stand density. Because of lack of vigor, dense forests are highly susceptible to insects and diseases, and consequently increase tree mortality. Excess tree mortality causes increased fuel loading, resulting in hazardous forest fire conditions that puts homes, watersheds, wildlife habitat, and other forest values at risk. These conditions also increase fire suppression costs and make wildfire control more difficult. So our primary focus would be on early detection of forest health issues within a community. Addressing problems when they're small is much more effective. And this is a uh, aerial photo I took in the Darrington area uh, from a helicopter of a bark beetle outbreak where we're able to identify early, go in and remove these trees and the surrounding trees and control the spread of these bark beetles. So a lot of this aerial detection work is really pays off. We complete a forest inventory using the same methodology as if we were preparing a forest conservation plan for an individual forest landowner. Using the NRCS planning process, we complete SWAPA. That is the inventory process of soil, water, air, plant, and animals within a community to identify resource concerns. Without a good inventory, we cannot develop good treatment prescriptions. The community decides on priorities with some coaching. This means balancing the ecological conditions of the forest with the intended purposes and the objectives of landowners. This gets tied to the objectives in the FireWise program so that all the goals are met. Forest health treatments include recognizing social and economic values, as well as the science used in developing silvicultural prescriptions. Site-specific prescriptions and practices can be employed to manage stand density, reduce vulnerability to insects and diseases, and reduce tree mortality, thereby reducing the buildup of hazardous fuels and the risk of a catastrophic wildfire. Improper operations can move the forest in the opposite of direction. Good silvicultural practices will promote regeneration of desired species and achieve the desired forest conditions and maintain diversity of tree species and age classes across the landscape. Previous stand history may also come into play in developing stand prescriptions. Heavy fuel loading is a serious concern in Western Washington. These conditions produce intense heat and are difficult to extinguish. In the back of the picture, you can barely see the peak of a roof in the dis very far distance. And we're out in zone three of the home ignition zone. We're looking toward that home. And just in front of these ferns in front of us here, there's a fire trail that's been fit to the topography. Uh, that's going around uh, zone, zone, separating zone two from zone three. It's kind of difficult to see if my pointer was working, I could maybe point it out, but I can't. A shaded fuel break has a positive effect on fire behavior. We believe that these treatments will reduce the expected wildfire loss of larger trees in the stand and keep fire on the ground. The forest health prescriptions favor specific species over other tree species. Trees are favored with healthy crowns, 
with lower limbs pruned. Targeted fuels and hazard trees are removed, including snags in the home ignition zone. And I really point that out because the snag on fire is not, nothing good to deal with. Fire trails and water sources are developed as part of other pre-fire planning activities. There's a lot that can be done before a wildfire occurs that helps those first responders and uh, uh, firefighters in their job. Fire season water storage and dry hydrants installed in some of our communities. Fire trails may be part of the pre-fire planning designed into the landscape so that features are located in defensible positions laid out in topographic breaks by personnel experience in fire control and a good understanding of fire behavior. And I mentioned this, EQIP is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program in Washington State, the NRCS uh, has dedicated 20% of the funding to forest health projects by local work groups. This allows individual landowners to implement forest health practices on their lands. These forest health improvement projects meet FireWise application requirements to become a recognized FireWise community, USA, and help secure funding. To check the accuracy of this model that we uh, put together, we compared the model to actual fire history over the last 100 years. We found that the model captured the fire return intervals on 90% of the UI wildfire high-risk areas. One factor that's hard to predict is weather. I took this picture one night on the Larson's Bridge project fire in 1979 in Skagit County. Normally a fire will lie down at night as the humidity increases and winds decrease. The opposite occurred this night. I don't know if you can see it in the photo here, but there's firebrands coming off the top of these flames and they're carrying the fire across the road, making it very difficult to control. In fact, we lost control of the fire that night. I want to thank these folks that contributed to helping put this model together to better understand the wildfire risks in Skagit County. Pause here for a minute. Uh, Folks from NRCS, uh, DNR, Forest Service, University of Washington, and the Conservation District. And it's a team approach. And a mere thanks to our partners that assisted us. And if you need some assistance on forestry or wildfire, please contact the Skagit Conservation District. Thank you, Nick. <laughs>